it's uh, great to have this opportunity to talk about this paper to, to you. Uh, it's a paper that I've talked about quite a few times in the past months, but always to trade economists. Uh, and so to get a perspective of the political economy crowd uh, will be very useful. Uh, and as much of my work is, this is joint work with Elkanon Heltman. So we're trying to understand, like many other people, we're trying to understand what's going on uh, in the international policy realm, the trade policy realm, and immigration as well. Um, why this sudden shift towards uh, you know, protectionism, anti-trade uh, in the U.S., but not only the U.S., why the anti-EU attitudes have... Uh, European uh, <coughs> parties are in favor of Europe, just want the European fundamental action. We leave one for the slides. <laughs> uh, yeah, I hope we're out of the woods, but I wouldn't bet that we're out of the woods. So we're, we're going to talk about, I'm going to offer you a story, uh, our attempt to understand uh, what's going on uh, with preferences on trade policies and outcomes on trade policies. Uh, I'm not going to attempt to prove this story to you. It's a very speculative paper. Uh, it takes us a bit outside our comfort zone of, of theorizing. Uh, and so think of it as, as a story with equations, uh, <coughs> offering a hypothesis with equations, if you will. Uh, and then, uh, as strong believers in comparative advantage, we believe someone should test it. We don't necessarily think we're the right people to test it, so uh, I'll toss that out there. Uh, so the story we're going to tell has to do with social identification, which I'll describe to you, uh, and changes in patterns of social identification, uh, a changing landscape, uh, as you see on this slide, of, of identity politics, uh, and in particular, a rise of populism, and I'll define that within the context of uh, the model that I'm going to try to show you. Um, so we're trying to think about a way to introduce identity politics or social identification uh, into uh, a, a, an electoral model of political competition that determines policies uh, and our particular interests in trade policy. Uh, and so the story is going to involve self-categorization. People choose how to identify themselves. If they choose how to identify themselves, of course, it's endogenous, and that can change. Uh, and so the story is going to be that events outside the model, uh, but we think we know what they are, uh, have triggered changes in the patterns of, of, of social identification. And those changes in pattern have changed preferences over trade policy, uh, at least enough among enough voters to swing uh, the outcome, uh, and that we can get a, a discrete jump in protectionism uh, once we start to think about uh, the effects of populism, which is a, a particular type of change in social identification. So what's social identity? Uh, social identity, uh, as defined in the social psychology literature and is emanating in a, in a prominent literature in that field, uh, beginning with Tuffle and his, and his student Turner. Uh, social identity is, well, well, humans are social beings, uh, and we get our sense of ourself, our feelings about ourselves, our uh, self-concept, if you will, uh, from our membership in social groups. Uh, and the key word that I've highlighted there is, well, maybe I'm not. It's probably not working. Okay. It's typical of our translators. <laughs> <laughs> the key word is perceived. Uh, this is all about how you think about yourself. Your social identity reflects uh, your, your self-concept. Uh, so in the works of Tuffle and, and Turner and a lot of lab experiments uh, that they did and others that have followed them, uh, well, this paper has some 20,000 citations, so it must be right. Uh, or very wrong. Or, or, yeah. <laughs> well, then it wouldn't probably peter out before 20,000. Uh, a person's sense of self is based on his or her group memberships. Uh, 
individuals can be, see themselves as members of a variety of different groups, non-exclusively and in some cases non-overlappingly. Uh, so your social class is an obvious uh, type of identity uh, that many people have, religion, ethnicity. Uh, in this room, probably football club uh, would be maybe at the top of the list. Uh, and these are source of, of pride and, and self-esteem. Uh, why do people see themselves that way? Because their self-image is enhanced by being part of a group, and particularly by part of a group uh, that has status in uh, society. Uh, but there's also a cost, and this is how we're going to get endogenous identification. The cost is if you perceive yourself as part of a group, but you also see yourself as very different than the prototypical member of that group, uh, that generates cognitive dissonance. Why am I uh, so different from this group that I'm supposedly uh, a, a part of? And as I say, the key is self categorization It's all in the mind of the beholder, or the mind of the identifier, if you will. Uh, Nobody, no permission is needed. There's no formal membership in so social identity. Uh, you can identify as you wish, and, and, and nobody has to give you permission to do so. Uh, nor is there coercion. If you have all uh, the attributes of an identity group, but you don't want to see yourself that way, nobody can force you to see yourself uh, that way. Uh, so the example I give uh, is uh, French ballerinas. I could, I could identify, self-identify myself as a French ballerina. If French ballerinas had very high status in society, then I might get some benefits from, from seeing myself in that way. Uh, there are two small problems. Uh, one is that my French is pretty middling. Uh, sorry? <laughs> I, di I didn't hear what you said. Probably not the main problem. Yes, that's right. <laughs> Just about what I was going to say. And the second problem is that my dancing is even worse, and, and you wouldn't want to see me uh, prancing around up here. Uh, so there's endogenous self-identification, and in this case, I don't typically see myself as a French ballerina because the dissidence costs uh, that would come from that outweigh uh, the benefits I would get in terms of, of self-esteem. In economics, uh, Akerlof and Cranton uh, have a, a well-known QJE paper which introduced the idea of uh, identity into economics uh, and thought about uh, how, it, how it might, social norms coming from identity might influence uh, behavior, choices. Uh, the paper that's really closest to ours in approach uh, is this paper by Moses Shio at, at Hebrew University. Uh, where he introduces the concept of a social identity equilibrium uh, in a, in a full-fledged equilibrium model. Uh, and he does so in exactly the same way I think any economist would if they sat down to think about it, but he did sit down to think about it, so we give him credit for that, uh, a great deal of credit for that. Uh, it adds the layer of consistency that we always want in an equilibrium model, uh, that the pattern of identification should be consistent with the environment and the policies that come out of that environment and the policies should be consistent with the pattern of identification and everything should be self-fulfilling in, in, in that way. So what are we going to do? We're going to take a political economy model off the shelf, one that we've used before but didn't invent. Uh, it's a model of electoral competition uh, stemming from Lindbeck and Bible and Dixit and Londrigan. Uh, and we used it in, in, in our book uh, a while ago, uh, that yields uh, policy determination in the context of a two-party election. Uh, and there was the point made earlier that uh, uh, a lot, certainly Americans working on political economy, uh, tend to use two-party models, uh, and I'll plead, plead guilty as charged. So you will be seeing today a, a two-party election. Uh, it's a model that determines what we call pliable policies, of which we're going to focus on trade policy, policies that the parties use to compete for votes, to win the elections, uh, in a context where they have other positions, say ideological positions, uh, that, that, that they don't change, uh, and that voters, voters have heterogeneous preferences about. So there's a background of party differences, 
uh, to be concrete. The Republicans are more conservative than the Democrats, say. There are voters who have different preferences, different feelings about them. Uh, but they also look at the trade policies uh, and they decide whether their preference, say, for the Republicans on ideological grounds might be outweighed by their preferences for the Democrats based on the trade policies that they would get if the Democrats won the election. Okay, so that's the, the political context. Um, in that context, we're going to, uh, oh, and I should say, uh, what that model predicts in its simplest form uh, is a utilitarian maximization. It's util maximization of a utilitarian welfare function in more complicated forms that I'll just mention in passing, uh, a weighted uh, sum of utilities. Uh, and so that's where, where we're going to go, except that our notion of utility is not going to, is going to consider, contain not only the usual, not only the material or economic man kind of uh, utility, uh, but also the psychosocial psycho components that come uh, from self categorization from self-identity. Uh, uh, and in that context, we're going to uh, introduce it in two, two phases. Uh, and if history is any um, lesson, then I'll only get through the first of these two. Uh, but maybe we'll be lucky today. In any case, in the first part of the paper, People's choices have to do with their socioeconomic class and their identification is with various categories of, 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 social, uh, of social class. Uh, and obviously that has been uh, a big part of what we've seen uh, in the US and in Europe uh, in recent years. Uh, late, later in the paper, we introduce differences in uh, racial identity or ethnic identity, racial identity being very salient in the US, ethnic and religious identity being more salient uh, in Europe, uh, and then we allow uh, for, for a broader set of identities because you can identify with your, with your ethnic group, with your social class, with the cross between the two, with none of the above. Uh, obviously, the, the set of possibilities multiplies quickly as we give uh, more options. What we're going to find, I mean, the story I'm going to tell you, not what we're going to find, because this is what we, what we set out to find, uh, but what we're going to, the story we're going to tell is that within any social identification regime, if you will, which is to say a description of how people identify that we hold constant, we'll get the usual comparative statics that if the uh, environment changes modestly, uh, then the policy preferences will change modest, modestly. And the, and the policy outcome from the electoral politics uh, will change continuously and, and modestly as well. But when there's a change in social identification regime, when people change the way they see themselves, that generates a discrete change in, in preferences, that generates a discrete change in policy. So the story I'm going to tell you is something happened to the working class so that they narrowed their identification they no longer see themselves as consonant with these uh, elites uh, in Wall Street uh, or in Silicon Valley. Uh, so they've changed their identification, they changed their policy preferences, uh, and that generated, a, in, in the model, uh, that generates a jump in protectionism as an outcome under some parameters uh, that, I'll, that I'll show you. Okay, so that's sort of where we're going. Okay, so I guess I said this already. We're going to start with a very simple environment, economically uh, familiar to, uh, uh, in, in the trade world, uh, a model with two skill levels and two goods, uh, and different factor intensities in the different industries. Uh, so the manufacturing worker, the, 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 the working class worker in the Rust Belt is used extensively in producing a good that competes with imports, steel, cars, textiles, what, what, what you will. Uh, and then a higher skill level uh, is used intensively in producing an export good, uh, financial services or stuff that, you know, high tech stuff coming out of uh, Silicon Valley. Uh, later on, uh, I'm going to introduce a third uh, skill level uh, or not, depending on how time goes. Okay, so the model is very familiar, as I say, it's in trade, it's the, the Heck-Sherlene uh, production structure. 
uh, two goods, export good, uh, those, those say Silicon Valley high tech goods and an import competing good and I guess I got them backwards. Uh, two factors, the highly skilled and the moderately skilled. I'll try to remember to say moderately skilled because later on there's a low skill but I'm so used to having high and low skilled in my trade models that sometimes uh, it slips out so you'll correct me or at least correct it in your mind if I say it. Uh, no education, exogenous supplies uh, of each. Uh, so there's a fraction of the population that's high skilled uh, and the remaining fraction uh, is moderately skilled for the time being uh, and the import competing good uses intensively these less skilled uh, workers among the pair. This by the way since this is not a trade audience I'll just uh, tell you where, where this is going. So this gives us a, a, a famous result in trade which is the Stoper Samuelson theorem which says if we protect the import competing good, if we put a tariff say on the import competing sector, that's going to raise the income of the workers who are used intensively there, namely the working class, the moderately skilled, uh, and it's going to lower the income uh, of the elite. And if we open to trade, it's going to do exactly the opposite, benefit the elites at the expense of the moderately skilled. Okay materialistic utility, if you will, or the utility that you would see uh, in any economic model that doesn't have a psychosocial component, uh, we assume to be quasi-linear. Why? Well, the first draft of the paper uh, had an usual sort of view of, of X and Z, and we found ourselves in multi multiple times having to say as long as income effects aren't too large and blah, 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 blah. And finally, we just decided to get rid of the income effects altogether. Uh, and so we assume it this way. Okay, since we're trying to tell a story, uh, we're not trying to be perfectly general in any case. Okay, so utility from the usual stuff is your consumption uh, of the export good and some increase in concave function uh, of the import competing good. The new stuff are these, is the psychosocial components that I've already uh, foreshadowed uh, two components that we're going to add into people's evaluation of policies and, uh, and utility. Uh, a positive component which is the pride from group membership, uh, the self-esteem from group membership which we're going to associate with the status of the group in material terms uh, so that if material utility of a group of, of a type goes up you're more likely to want to uh, identify that way. If, social baller if French ballerinas become more socially esteemed, uh, then it becomes more likely, although not very likely, that I'll want to see myself that way. Yes, I'll stop. So, okay. some of the emergence of these you know, nationalistic uh, uh, anti trade policies are also in countries that we think of compared to our advantage in less skilled, intensive products. Some Eastern European countries, for instance. Uh, is that consistent with our views? Or could I, I guess you're thinking of. No, you need a richer model, yeah, but I am exactly. thinking, of, I'm thinking of the US. Let's, okay. let's just, just say Poland the US. Or, yes, or, not Poland. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, a similar question, and maybe that's what we're going to do with the three skills uh, and uh, uh, ethnic groups. Um, but if, if this is about uh, class war, why isn't just trade redistribution rather than trade policy the actual instrument? I mean, I agree in a heterogeneous model, I can uh, uh, achieve uh, uh, taxation of the export sector, of the rich in the export sector by taxing uh, uh, trade, but I can just tax income and wealth. It's a great question, and it's one that the political economy of trade literature hasn't answered in, in 30, 40 years, and I'm not going to answer it today. Uh, the assumption is that that's a salient instrument and others uh, are not used, but there's no really good answer. It's a great question, that, and there is no great answer that I know. Okay, so getting back into the stream, the pride that comes from membership in the group, and as I, as I uh, mentioned, uh, the dissonance costs come from differences between yourself and the prototypical member of the group that you might contemplate uh, joining. 
Okay, so the political model, as I say, is, is, is off the shelf. There are two political parties. They have different ideological positions, which we take as exogenous. Uh, they have some policies, and as Giacomo pointed out, why trade policies? Well, because that's what we're studying here, and we don't have a good answer to that, but they have some policies that they use instrumentally to maximize their votes. They're willing to support any policies uh, that, that, that win them popularity, uh, perhaps so that they can implement their ideological agenda, or perhaps because they like being in power or for whatever uh, reason. Uh, voters have heterogeneous views over ideology. Some are strongly conservative, some are mildly conservative, some are left of center, some are way out there. Uh, and they vote for their preferred party, taking into account uh, the trade platform and the ideology. So each voter walks in the booth, comes in with some preference for one party or the other, a strong one or a weak one, sees the two trade policy positions and votes for the one that they like better, weighing one against the other. Okay, and as I said, this model's been studied before, and the finding uh, that, 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 that it yields uh, is that, first of all, the instrumental policy positions converge, which in our context is not a bad prediction because the trade policy positions of the two parties over the years uh, are, are remarkably similar. Sometimes the rhetoric uh, changes, but not, only, not always. Uh, at the end of the day, the policies don't look that different. Uh, and Trump's trade policies didn't look that different from Sanders' trade policies, actually. So even in this election, uh, there was an element of, of convergence in at least some aspects of, of the positions. Uh, so the, 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 get back in, that was a long sentence, but the, the policy positions converge, and where do they converge? Well, if the different groups in society have the same distribution of preferences over the ideology, over their right-leftness, if you will, uh, then they converge to the policy that maximizes uh, a utilitarian sum of utilities, which is what we're going to go with here. But equally well, and this is the point of the Dixit Londrigan paper, if the parties, uh, if the distribution of preferences are different across different groups in society, say the skilled and the unskilled in our context here, uh, then the outcome will be a policy that maximizes a, a weighted sum of utilities, where the weights are the number of swing voters in the group, the number that are in the middle centrists who could go either way, who are the ones that are at stake uh, in the electoral competition because they're the ones that you can hope to win uh, by announcing a favorable policy for them. Parenthetically, uh, there's a, a hot off the press paper about the Trump tariffs uh, by uh, Pablo Fagelbaum, Penny Goldberg, Amit Kanderwal, which um, averages the Trump tariffs in all the counties uh, in the U.S., weighting them by, uh, by the industry employment shares of the different counties uh, and then plots them against the county's vote shares in the last election. Uh, and it looks just like this, peaking right at 50% or 51% or something, meaning that Trump uh, managed somehow to, to, to announce a set of tariffs uh, that were most favorable to the swing voters, uh, less favorable uh, to his court base voters and less favorable to the left, you know, Democratic districts as well, uh, exactly as this kind of model of political competition would suggest. But that's not today's paper, but it's, it's yesterday's fascinating. Paper. It's yesterday's paper, exactly, and it's fascinating. Okay, so we're going to maximize utilitarian <laughs> welfare, because that's what the political model tells us to do. The new component is that welfare now includes not only material elements, but these psychosocial components so we have to reevaluate what it is, what trade policy maximizes uh, welfare. So that's mechanically what we're going to look for. And then we're going to look for a social identity equilibrium in the spirit of Shio, making sure that the trade policies we get are consistent with the pattern of social identification that underlies those preferences, that underlies the election, that underlies the trade policies. <coughs> 
Okay, so in this literature, small as it is, uh, the set of possible identity groups is historically or context given uh, and usually taken as exogenous, and we'll do that today. Uh, so the set of ways that you can identify yourself uh, is just out there in, 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 in uh, society. Uh, and we're going to keep it very simple here to, to make the point uh, by allowing three potential identity groups in this first part of the paper. So one identity group we're going to call working class. Also the definitions of these groups are exogenous. So a working class is defined relative to a prototypical member. And we're going to take the prototypical working class individual to be uh, an individual with the income and social status of uh, a moderately skilled individual in the manufacturing sector. Okay, in other, in other words, one of these moderately skilled workers in, in the model is the prototype. Uh, and anybody in the model can choose to see themselves that way. And the second uh, identity group we'll call the elite. The prototypical member is a highly educated, skilled worker uh, who earns high income, uh, who works in the, who can work anywhere, but has that factor that's intensively used in the export sector. Uh, and then the third category is one we have problems with, and this word is causing us a lot of problems, so we're still fishing around for a better one that, uh, that won't generate debate, but we, we called it national, but nationalist has such a role in this discussion that it's not quite the right word, so then we called it American, but a lot of populism is about redefining what it means to be American, uh, and um, we want this category to be constant, not being redefined, although the way people identify themselves is going to be redefined. So what we're going to mean by national, again, if you have a better word, I'm, I'm all ears, is a very broad group that includes all of the members of society. And you may or may not view yourself in that broad sense at the same time or instead of viewing yourself in a more narrow sense. So each individual, and there are, going to be two, there are two types of individuals so far, there's more skilled and there's less skilled. They can view themselves as member of the working class, they can view themselves as elites, they can view themselves as in this broader category. So the first two are mutually exclusive. The first two. The prototypes are mutually, and when, as soon as I click, the answer is going to be yes. In principle, um, you could view yourself as both working class and elite. Uh, the same way you could view yourself both as a uh, French ballerina and, uh, and a, a British football player. They're not mutually exclusive, but probably they're not overlapping in reality. <coughs> so that leads to exactly the point you're getting at, was who identifies uh, as working class? Uh, well, in this case, the prototype I said was a less skilled individual. The difference between a typical less skilled individual and the prototype is zero and therefore there's no dissonance cost for a less skilled individual to view themselves that way and so all of them will choose to identify themselves as working class. Now it could be, one second, because I might preempt you, it could be that uh, some, some, social, some, stat, some potential identity groups don't give you much status, don't give you much strong self-esteem. For example, we could have a social group of the homeless, and even if you were homeless, you may not choose to identify, your, think of yourself as homeless, because that doesn't give you a lot of status in society. Uh, but rather than having lots and lots of cases, we're just going to assume that it it's provides some benefits for the moderately skilled to see themselves as working class, and there are no costs. Uh, and so they do so. Now your question. Yeah, so, so relating to what you just presented, then uh, in the important realm of terminology, I would suggest the leveraging that these are the moderately skilled guys and calling it middle class, because in the US, everyone wants to consider themselves middle class and typically do, except possibly President Trump. Uh, uh, whereas, uh, I believe, very few people that uh, sociologists would consider working class, consider themselves working class and class. 
so it seems to be the case that the desirable identity that makes you feel good about yourself is middle class, but working class is a bit closer to what you're saying about the homeless. Maybe it's solo status, that although I could, I resist. Manufacturing worker class, is that better? Or? <laughs> <laughs> manufacturing yeah, manufacturing that's, that's, employees, I don't know. Yeah. But you know, in the model it's very clear and the words just are difficult. Now as I said, it's all in the mind of the beholder, so the high skilled could view themselves this way. Um, but that wouldn't make much sense, uh, as, as the previous question suggested. So we're going to just, without writing down uh, equations, we're just going to assume that the distance, the difference between uh, the, the, the elites and its prototypical working class individual are so large that the elites don't see themselves as working class. So this is trivial and this is not going to change. All of the low skilled, I did it, all of the moderately skilled uh, identify as, as working class, none of the elites do. And similarly and symmetrically, all of the high skilled see themselves as, as elites uh, and none of the uh, moderately skilled do, and that's trivial as well. So all the action here is in this last category, uh, broadly identifying uh, as with, with the country, with America, with the entire uh, American population. Uh, and this is gonna be endogenous because nobody is exactly the average. The average material well-being is, is an average of the high skilled and the moderately skilled. All the individuals in the model are away from that average and so there are dissonance costs of viewing yourselves as typical American. Uh, the more so as those guys in New York and, and so especially in New York I guess become richer and richer and the guys in Detroit see themselves as very different from, from that average. Okay, so working towards maximizing utilitarian social welfare function, let's just develop quickly an expression for that. Uh, so this, it's gonna be a small country that's a little, that takes prices as given. Uh, I used to apologize for that until again, this paper that uh, was presented yesterday showed if in fact, uh, terms of trade for the US haven't changed with the Trump tariff. So these are the terms of trade. Uh, the policy that's at stake is, is a tariff and it generates a material well-being for an individual with skill I equal to the wage of that skill group, that's the income, plus a share of the tariff revenues that get rebated to the population lump sum, plus the consumer surplus that comes from consuming uh, the import competing good. And then there's the psychosocial component. Uh, so for one group, uh, say the skilled, it's the intercept of, of how much benefits you get uh, from uh, identifying as an elite, plus a component that depends upon the, the social status of the elites, which is their material well-being, times some coefficient. So this is, this is a high skilled person psychosocial utility from identifying with, with being a member of the elite. No negative term because there's no dissonance there. And then an indicator, which is whether or not you decide to also identify broadly, B for broadly, times the self esteem you get from that, plus the, the benefit associated with the status of the average. So this is the positive stuff, the pride stuff. And then this is the dissonance cost, which is a function, of, which is a, we specify as a difference between yourself and the average squared. So obviously, the elites, the skilled are gonna identify broadly with the nation if this positive thing is bigger than this thing. Otherwise, they don't have to, there's no co coercion. Uh, and so they can set this to zero and it's never going to be a detraction from their utility. <coughs> okay, so now we just add up across everybody, everybody being these two different skill groups. Uh, so we have uh, the 
status from identifying with your own social class for elites and working class. This is written in a way that makes it hard for me to talk about. I probably should change the slide. But this one reflects everyone's own material well-being. So if we sum the material well-beings across the entire economy, we get aggregate income. We get aggregate tax revenues. We get aggregate consumer surplus. And everybody is, in, is part of the aggregate, obviously. So that's the one. And this part here comes from, well, the moderately skilled are getting a benefit associated with the income and material well-being uh, of middle skilled individuals, of working class individuals. The elites are getting a benefit from being associated with the high skilled individuals. So we add those two together and we get alpha times the sum of the material well-beings, which is just national income again. Uh, so let me just say that again so that it's clear. So the one is the own material well-being and the alpha <laughs> multiplying the same thing is the fact that each social class is identifying with others like them in their social class. And when we add that all up, that gives us again the aggregate uh, welfare. Then we have these two terms down here, which are the ones that have to do with whether or not the two uh, groups identify broadly. Uh, and these are the benefits minus the dissonant costs. I won't go through all the terms because you've seen them already. OK, so now let's talk about uh, the equilibrium policy. Uh, so here's our utilitarian social welfare function with these new elements. And we're just going to look for a policy that maximizes it, which is what comes out of the political model. Uh, and then we're going to check that we're OK on Shio grounds, that in fact the assumptions we make underlying uh, the, the, the identity regime uh, are consistent with the policy outcome. So what are these guys? These guys are utility within an identity regime. So there's some policy. If we take this as 0 or 1, or this as 0 or 1, clearly we have four choices. They both could identify broadly. They neither could identify broadly, or one or the other could identify broadly. So we have four identity, social identity regimes here. Fixing that, we have a very straightforward maximization problem. And it gives an aggregate social welfare function that looks like that. And for each regime, there's a, there's a peak. So this is the uh, policy uh, that would uh, maximize that thing. If nobody identifies broadly, I guess here is if everyone identifies broadly, uh, here if only the moderately skilled do, and here if only the high skilled do. This ordering is something that I'm going to have to come back to. I've just drawn it because you know, I had to commit myself. I'm going to draw a picture, but we'll come back to that. Okay, the point I want to make now is that if we go to the global max, which is here, and what does it mean we go to the global max? It means these politicians, these political parties are competing for votes. So they're fishing around for a policy that will be attractive to the voters. And any particular policy will be attractive to some voters and not attractive to others. Moreover, they know that some of those voters they can't win anyway because they're strongly conservative or they're strongly uh, liberal. So they're looking to win those votes in the middle. So they announce a policy and they're trying to win the most votes they can. And the Sorry, identities after or before the vote is Same time. It's all simultaneous. Static model. So if, we, if they announce this policy, then they better think that, in fact, if that's the policy that the voters think, see, then this will be the identity regime uh, that, that they will confront, because it's all simultaneous, simultaneous as, as we just said. Uh, as long as we, they go to the global max, well, what might happen is this at, this at this policy, one of the other groups might decide not to identify broadly. But if one of the other groups decided not to identify broadly, this is the utility, this gap here 
is how much the utility would lose because this guy tells us exactly what we get from this policy if the moderately skilled don't identify broadly. And this thing is positive. So in fact, they want to identify broadly. They don't want to identify more narrowly. If I had more time and I said all those words, I didn't confuse myself. If I didn't go to the global max, I would get the opposite conclusion that somebody was being forced uh, to identify in a way that generates negative utility, which wouldn't be consistent with the equilibrium. So the lemma is, as long as we go to the global max, and only if we go to the global max do we get consistency with the, uh, with the shy condition. Yes? I have one, maybe two related questions. Um, is there? You can have one related question. You, you can have two related questions. Very good. So is there any sense in which I can think about entry of ideology into your world? There are three fixed ideas, I understand that. And this is my suggestion for Is there any way you can think of that's a great question. It's it's so. Okay, go. Yeah. There's no sense in which ideology requires scale, meaning that you don't need to have certain number of people to get benefits of ideology. If there's two of us inside ideology, that's just as well as twenty million of us. Do you mean ideology or identity? Uh, sorry, ideology. Identity. Identity. Right. So can identity? How can I think about entering a world of identity if there's no scale benefits for identity? Right, so, okay, let me take the first question. So, so this literature, as I said, takes the set of salient possibilities as given. Um, we think uh, that part of the Trump phenomenon was responding to changes in press pre preferences, but part of it was political entrepreneurship helping to make certain identities more salient, in particular white working class uh, as, as an identity. Uh, and so we think there's a paper to be written, or many, may, maybe many papers to be written, which brings in a role for the politicians to promote certain types of, of identity. And it's a great question. Uh, it's not going to be today, but it's one that I'd like to answer uh, someday. Uh, in terms of the scale, um, I guess one thing I didn't say was the prototypes are also exogenous. Um, it, they're not determined by who else identifies that way. So we all know what a French ballerina is. Even if no French ballerina identifies themselves that way, w we still compare ourselves to this concept of a French ballerina. Uh, and on the other hand, if, you know, if a bunch of uncoordinated uh, Princeton professors happen to identify as French ballerinas, that doesn't change uh, the broad concept of other people's decision whether they identify that way. Uh, but that also immediately raises the question, where, where do these prototypes come from? Uh, and that's also, you know, future research for us or somebody else. Yeah. So I don't want to waste your time, but a clarifying question. Why isn't there equilibrium multiplicity? where, you know, if the parties expect identity to be zero, they go to a certain policy that's optimal for zero identity, therefore it is self-sustaining. If they expect identity to be uh, only the high guy. Yes, it's, so it's, to give you an answer that won't satisfy you, but we can talk about an answer. It, it comes technically out of the quasi-linearity and the fact that the components are additive uh, and don't interact in any way. Um, so if you had you of your material well-being and your psychological well-being, then you would get exactly that situation. The fact that they're, they're separable um, makes the differences be between any two of these curves just the extra component you get from identifying, and that, that, allowed, that eliminates the multiplicity that you're worried about. But that takes more thought than we have time for at the moment. Okay, so let me, I have 15 minutes, I'm going to tell you what happens in a, in, in a given identity regime and then I'm going to jump ahead and talk about uh, populist revolution, uh, skipping a few parts in between uh, and as I predicted I won't get to the, to the ethnicity. Um, okay, so first let's backtrack, forget about all this social identity stuff, let's go back to the original political economy model. Uh, Voters have different ideological preferences. Uh, the skilled guys want 
free trade or more than free trade, free trade on steroids, export subsidies that maximizes their income. Uh, the working class, the moderately skilled, want tariffs that protect them because that raises their income. They compete in the political realm, or rather, the po political parties compete for their votes. Uh, the outcome, as, we, as I already said, was the one that maximizes aggregate because they're competing for those swing voters. Uh, and uh, in, this, in a small country without any economic distortions, the policy that maximizes aggregate uh, material well-being is free trade. Okay, so this is the baseline. If we didn't have any social identity, any identity politics, we'd end up with free trade. We like that, we, we set it up that way because that's a nice benchmark, uh, but there's a section of the paper that uh, looks at the median voter model. The median voter presumably is, is a low-skilled individual and therefore in the median voter model, the benchmark is in free trade. Nonetheless, we can get the same jumps in protection that, that we're talking about. Okay, so start with free trade. And now suppose that nobody identifies with the nation. Okay, well, the, the, the moderately skilled care not only about their pocketbook, but also about being a part of this working class, so they care about other members of the, uh, of the moderately skilled. And so that makes them even more stridently in favor of protection. And the skilled workers caring about the elites are evenly more str stridently uh, anti-protection, globalists if you will. And the outcome is just like the initial political competition balance, this one will as well, maximizing Aggregate material well-being is the same thing as maximizing one plus alpha times aggregate material well-being, even though the second one is more, the feelings in the second world are, are stronger than the feelings in the first world. So if nobody identifies broadly, we end up with free trade. As soon as anybody identifies broadly, we don't end up with free trade. Why? Because everybody now gets this, an extra benefit from the welfare of the nation, but also pays a cost associated with inequality, associating with being different from the average. What's that cost? Well, it's those dissonance costs we were talking about. You're associating with a group, the average member of which is not just like you. That makes you a little uncomfortable. You know, I go to, to my uh, three-star restaurant in New York, and I buy a $1,000 bottle of wine, and I enjoy the wine, but if I'm also seeing myself as middle class, as uh, Giacomo suggested I would, then that might make, make me feel a little bit uncomfortable. Uh, and so uh, the, the narrower the difference between the wine I'm drinking and the wine that the everyman drinking uh, lessens that discomfort. So we call this altruism for selfish reasons. Nobody has any fairness concerns or social justice concerns in this model. Everybody just cares about themselves. But they don't like inequality conditional on identifying broadly because that inequality makes them feel a little bit uncomfortable about themselves. And the greater that inequality, the more, more such discomfort there is. Uh, so protect, protection in, in the Heckscher lean model narrows income distribution, raises the w income of the Moderately skilled, reducing the income of the, of the top skilled, reduces those differences, and therefore uh, reduces the dissidence costs. So as soon as anybody identifies broadly, we end up with protection. Why? Because starting from free trade, adding a little bit of protection generates a second order loss of aggregate welfare, but a first order reduction in how much inequality there is, therefore a first order reduction in how much dissidence costs there are, and so you're going to move the polity or the politicians or the parties are going to move somewhere in that direction. More so, the more groups that identify uh, broadly. Okay, so that's what the first proposition says. If people care about their differences from the average, then if no one identifies with the nation, we end up with free trade, and otherwise we end up with protection. If I had more time, I could talk about these comparative statics within a regime, but I want to talk about the 
the main story, so let's jump ahead to populism. Okay, so we're going to talk about changes in identity regime. What do we have in mind? We have in mind that the income distribution in the U.S. and, and elsewhere has spread over the last 30 years enormously, in fact. Uh, and what caused it, in this model it doesn't really matter what caused it. Okay, if people change their identity because they feel uncomfortable seeing themselves as average, it doesn't matter whether that, that change was caused by skill bias technological progress, one of the leading candidates, or whether it was caused by uh, the China shock, another leading candidate, or caused by changes in, 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 tr in tax policies, uh, a third candidate, uh, all probably part of the story. But the key is, as the income distribution spreads, it becomes more costly to see yourself very broadly. You're more different than uh, the average. Populism, what is it? Well, uh, we could have a, a whole course or you know, conference on, on that question alone. Uh, we draw on this, this book by this uh, Princeton uh, political philosopher uh, who has a, a fairly accepted or centrist kind of view on what populism is. It's an anti-pluralist, according to him, this should be some quotes, more quotes here than here, anti-pluralist elite critical politics with a moral claim to representation. <coughs> Populists criticize elites, but not only that, they see only uh, the, the everyman as worthy of, uh, as the true, true worthy of consideration in the policy setting. Okay, so it's, as, as Mueller says, it's a form of identity politics, it's a particular form of identity politics, whereby a class in society, the everyman, rejects the elites as being part of their, their self-concept, part of a legitimate uh, group that's being served by the polity and narrows down to the true American or the, uh, the narrower class. Uh, so that's what, in t terms of the model, that's how we're going to conceive of it. We're going to start with an equilibrium where the working class sees themselves broadly and now because of a spread in the income distribution, because of a increasing differences between them and, and the elites, now they reject uh, their broad classification, they reject the elites, and they identify more narrowly. Okay, so since I'm running out of time, so what's that going to do? That's going to uh, reduce uh, the benefits f for the working class of uh, seeing themselves broadly, also for the elites, by the way, because they, they too uh, become more different from the average as, as the income distribution spreads. This peak might move over a little bit as we've drawn it here. That's within a regime. If nothing changed, we would get a different change, different policy coming out of the fact uh, that people's preferences change uh, as the income distribution changes because the benefits they see from redistribution uh, are, are changing. Uh, but the more obvious uh, and, and point that the story we want to tell is that uh, as it became more difficult for the working class to identify broadly, eventually this peak falls below this one and we end up going from this policy to this policy. We end up going a discrete change in policy as a result of a discrete change in uh, identification regime. Now I conveniently drew this to the, right, to, to the right of this, which is to say that as we have a populist revolution, we end up with more protection. Unfortunately, that's not guaranteed here. Uh, we need some conditions, uh, and since I'm running out of time, there's this, I have to go through all the terms to, to tell you what it is, but basically the punchline is if the elites are a big fraction of society, then, then protection will fall. If they're a small fraction of society, then protection will, will rise. Uh, if we stick in some, some made up numbers here so that the benefits you get from social identification are one tenth as big as the benefits you get uh, from your own pocketbook, uh, then it turns out uh, that the tariff jumps if the elites are less than seven and a half percent of the total. Okay, more generally, 
a small enough elite will always get you to jump in, in, in protection. Okay, so, so bottom line, the story we're trying to tell is identity regime has changed. The working class, the moderately skilled, have changed the way they see themselves. They no longer see themselves broadly as together in a group with these stinking rich. Uh, that changes their policy preferences, which plays out in the political realm into a change in protection. And since the elites are pretty small part of society, that gives rise to a jump in protection. We could add envy. Notice I haven't said anything about how you feel about outgroups here. Either you get benefits from, from being in a group or nothing. You could also hate those outgroups. This is probably part of populism as well. It's not in the social identity theory, but it, but it sounds, sounds right, at least to us. If you add in envy, uh, you get a similar result, but even stronger, that even for a broader range of sizes of the elite, we're going to get a jump in protection. You could add in social and, and, and racial identification, and you could talk about narrowing not only in the socioeconomic groups, but also in the uh, ethnic groups that you're willing to consider yourself part of. So you might have thought of yourself broadly uh, as working class uh, 20 years ago, uh, but now the ethnic divisions, the racial divisions in the U.S. have become more salient, and now there's a narrower group, which is white working class, uh, which doesn't include the minority workers, and it particularly doesn't include the immigrant workers uh, these days. Uh, and then we have some results how that's going to lead to uh, an increase in protection as well under some conditions. But since I'm out of time, I'll wrap up. So after the last U.S. election, every major news outlet ran the same article with the, more or less the same title, uh, Voters Don't Vote Their econom <coughs> Economic Interests. And what they meant by that is that all these working class voters voted for Trump uh, thinking, or maybe not thinking, but expecting that uh, policies would come out that would re redistribute income to themselves. Uh, most of the people who wrote those articles also didn't vote their economic interests because they were uh, above average income earners uh, who were voting for the Democrats uh, despite the fact that Trump's policies were probably better for them. So routinely people don't vote their e economic interests. Uh, we're not surprised by that because we think there are more than economic interests at heart. There are these social uh, concerns as well. They, they, there's worrying about uh, uh, others in society, but importantly, uh, we think that voters don't care about all others in society. They only care, care about others in society that they see as similar to themselves. Uh, and we think that that changes over time. So that's sort of what we're trying to sell today, uh, is bringing these identity concerns and the endogenous determinant of a social identity regime into political economics, we think is, is, is needed to understand uh, what we're seeing today. Uh, as soon as you deviate from economic man in any realm of, uh, uh, of economics, uh, you're suddenly faced with lots of choices. Uh, you know, there's only one way to be super rational, but there's an infinite ways to deviate from super rationality. Uh, here, it's not irrational to have these psychological concerns. Um, but for example, uh, do, do individuals get pride from the absolute status of the group they're members of or the relative status of the group they're members of. Well, you could make an argument both ways. I don't think we have data that tell us that, uh, but we're going to have to commit ourselves if we write uh, a model. So we're not wedded to those kinds of details. We're more wedded uh, to bringing in social identity and to thinking about political economy. Uh, we think that it would be really helpful for thinking about immigration policy, which we don't do in this paper, but that seems to be all about identity. Uh, more grandiosely uh, and somewhat in line with the, the first paper this afternoon, uh, we think that societies that have more homogeneous societies, I'll wrap up, uh, <laughs> have more homogeneous societies, have done better in growth terms than ones that are more divided along uh, ethnic and, and tribal lines. We think that thinking about growth policies 
uh, might help be helped by this sort of, of thinking as well. Uh, and then as several of you raised as well, uh, the bigger question is what determines the set of groups out there, the characteristics of the, of the identity uh, groups, uh, changes over time, uh, surely endogenously, uh, but we don't have a good handle on that. And I stop. Thank you.